a great there goes that voice. <laughs> We're super appreciative of, um, of him being here. And uh, he's an expert of NLP. And he will be teaching you guys today um, something that you can take, as he mentioned, um, to, to implement every single day of your life. So we're excited for that. Robert, you're the boss. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. So today we've got about 45 minutes and I've got a lot to cover. What I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about what NLP is just for a moment, but then what I'm going to teach you today is an app, a specific application of NLP that will make working with yourself and others a lot easier. Think of your personality like a river that flows through your life and it has a direction that it flows. And the areas in your life where things come very easy and very natural to you, um, even if they're, you know, seem somewhat impressive or challenging to other people, but the areas that come easy and natural to you, chances are the way you're going about that area of your life really fits your personality and how you're wired. That's part of the reason why you're attracted to it. And the areas in your life where it feels like you're struggling or it's more challenging those areas, it's kind of like you're swimming upstream and you're fighting your personality and how you are wired, whether that's how you internally motivate yourself or how you externally set up your world. And, you know, my specialty over the last 20 years has been people puzzles. I started in mental health for about a decade. I've been a professional executive coach for 20 years now. I've done subcontracting work with the government on severe military sexual trauma uh, I've gone and done consulting for banks. I've uh, coached some of the top sales guys at Oracle, professional athletes. I work with people all over the board. What all of that has in common is getting people to do things that seem really hard or impossible to do, overcoming really big habits, really big challenges, whether they're professional or personal. And a huge part of that is understanding how people are wired and how they work and how to help them get what they want more easily. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of areas naturally, I think you're gonna discover that you're fighting yourself. And the way you're going about what you're doing is totally counterproductive. And the good news in that is once you get this basic understanding of what I'm gonna teach you today, you should be able to take that right back into what you're doing right after lunch and suddenly make things easier. Whether it's communicating with a loved one that's been challenging, or whether it's um, approaching a certain aspect of your work, this should make it a lot easier. Now, NLP is short for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It means to reprogram your nervous system through the use of language. I do have a free introduction to NLP on my website at nlpca.com. That's short for NLP of California. There is a short, uh, there's a, it's a one hour introductory video. Um, there are some PDFs in there. You can all get that for free after today. That's not what I'm going to teach you right now. What I'm going to teach you right now is the application that I was telling you about. And this comes from a course that I teach called How to Read and Lead with Integrity. So I'm going to do a share screen and I'm going to jump right into this. Okay. So um, today we're going to be able to teach you, there's about 20 patterns or 20 levels to this when it's all said and done. But one of the things that's um, unique about how I teach personality profiling and influence is we teach it with integrity. We don't ever want you to do anything that isn't 100% genuine or real or from the heart. And also, this is so easy to understand. I can get a whole team of people. I can go into a company and teach this, and they're using it forever by the end of the first day. They're joking about it at lunchtime on day one. That's how easy this stuff is to really assimilate and start to take into your bones, okay? So, but I'm gonna teach you just two levels today. Now, as we get into this, you know, the question that always comes up is, you know, why should I listen to you? You know, should I pay attention? Does this stuff really work? As I said, my specialty is people puzzles and I've been doing this for, you know, professionally since 2002, 10 years before that, still working in mental health, but really doing this full-time professionally since 2002. Um, and I've worked with thousands and thousands and thousands of clients on the most challenging habits and um, issues you can imagine, phobias, traumas, massive weight loss, things like that. So I'm just going to give you a couple quick examples 
to just show you what this stuff can do. And realize what I'm going to teach you today, the personality piece, um, it will make or break the success in any one of these outcomes. Literally, what I do with two people, I might have to do the complete opposite. There are some people where literally how I handle them, what works beautifully for them would bomb for another personality. And what works great for them would bomb for this other person. So it's not just enough to know what needs to happen next, right? There's a whole language to how your nervous system works and how to work with yourself. So think of all the areas in your life where you know what you should do, like whether it's exercise or fitness or professionally, you, you know things, if I just do these things, things are going to get better, but you can't get yourself to do it. This is going to start to help you understand why that is and how to go about fixing it. Okay. So person number one here, I'm just going to show you a couple of these. This is Cecile. She came in, she quit smoking, then lost weight. I like to show this one because a lot of people think if I quit smoking, I'm going to gain a bunch of weight. She quit smoking, lost 122 pounds, kept it off for over three years. So I never publish testimonials unless someone has kept weight off for at least over two years, because usually statistically they gain it back by then. So this shows real lasting change in the nervous system. Okay. Here's another guy, Lonnie, smoked free over 15 years, lost, um, I think, you know, 25 to 30 pounds in a short period of time. He's referred lots of people and he quit smoking in one session with me. Okay. Um, here is uh, an example of a real estate agent. Now, this woman worked at Cisco and she was doing real estate part time. She took the full how to read and lead people with integrity course, and she had a 283% increase in her volume um, that year. And she has since the update on uh, Karen is she has since quit her job at Cisco, uh, she went into full time real estate, and then opened up a, um, uh, a brokerage company. So she actually became her own broker and she's doing very, very well using this stuff. Um, here is um, a, a small graphics art, graphic art company. Um, when they originally came to see me, um, phase one, the goal was to coach the sales team and executive staff for three months. Now, coaching with me for three months in a company like this is we maybe get together for two hours, twice a month. It's not a lot of time, but it's enough time to teach them the basics of what they need to know. Their goal was they wanted to increase annual sales and high-end corporate client list, okay? The year before they worked with me, they were at about 234,000, you know, just kind of starting out. The year after, um, 812,000. And they got the contract to do those license plate covers for Tesla. Um, I actually, I have one on my Tesla out front here for the Tesla license plate covers. That was one of their big corporate contracts, which is one of the kind of goals they had. She has since sold this company. She sold it. Um, she built it up, I think over three years and sold it for over a million dollars. I'm not exactly sure the exact money dollar amount, but then she went on to something else. Okay. Um, here's a local bank and in phase one for them, um, their goal was in particularly in the area of commercial real estate loans, they, they were like not performing the way that they wanted to. And so their goal was to, you know, increase these new loans written in that particular market. The January before I worked with them, they were at about 2 million. Again, I did a brief three-month coaching, teaching them some of these things I'm going to be sharing with you today. And the next January, they did over 7 million, okay? Uh, it was, uh, and this is after the three months of coaching, it just, it shot up. It just doubled like that. And it became a lot easier and their sales cycle shortened dramatically on top of that, because what I'm going to be covering here will make your communication not only easier, but it's going to make it way more economical because you're, you're really eliminating 8% of the waste by going, here's what's important. Here's what these people care about. And here's what will cause them stress. So you know what to talk about and what specifically to avoid. That's going to make the biggest impact. Um, now, they have also, this company, um, you know, the president who I worked with directly has since sold the company for $55 million and he's retired. So he's doing well. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> let's get into this. Now, what I'm going to teach you is what's called the personality profile matrix. This is in-house. We have a book that we're publishing, um, hopefully uh, <laughs> late September, early October, that has this written out in more greater detail. I also have a three-day uh, program that I do, and we are putting one online as we speak uh, about this, but I've been teaching this for a long time. And it's pretty road tested. 
Your personality profile matrix, think of them as patterns of perception that you habitually act upon. And what they do is they, they provide different filters for how you see the world. Um, we're not responding to the totality of what's happening, you know, of, of what's happening in the world. Um, we're kind of responding to like a hair on the tail of the elephant. And we're trying to make sense of the elephant by looking at, you know, a hair on the tail of the elephant. And so we're not taking in the full picture, depending on, you know, which neuroscientist you talk to. Um, There's a great book uh, called Flow by Mahai Chitset Mahai published many years ago. And he said, there's about 2 million bits of information of sensory input. We could absorb at any one second. But out of that, we're lucky if we take in 134 between our conscious and our unconscious mind. And then in 1957, there was a paper done by a guy named George Miller, who discovered that on our best days, we can actually track about nine things consciously. Most days, it's four or five. So out of the two million things that are available to us, we're lucky if we can consciously focus on four or five. And so one of the ways to think about your attention is it's a lot like a stereo receiver. Or for those who don't remember stereos, like a web address. What you tune into, you get. And you get that to the exclusion of everything else because your mind can only consciously you know, manage a few things at a time. So it will be dominated by that and will push everything else out. Um, some aspects of your personality profile matrix will differ depending on the context. So they're kind of context specific um, where others are gonna be completely fixed and the personal needs, which is the big one I'm gonna teach you today, they're fixed, they don't change, they don't go away. Whatever your number one and your number two is, your dominant ones, those are dominant forever. And they affect everything that you do from how you buy a pair of jeans to the car you buy, to the partner you pick, to the career you pursue, to the house you buy, to where you want to live. It affects everything that you do. Okay. And it's very useful in predicting uh, behavior and identifying stumbling blocks in the future, particularly before they actually occur. Okay. They're also derived from uh, early what we call imprinting, which is a kind of, you know, big memorable event that happened when you were young, usually between the ages of about three and 13 or three and seven, depending again on which psychologist that you ask. And during that imprint phase of life, we make decisions about ourselves that are very, very out of our awareness, very unconscious. Most of it is kind of inherited from our caregivers, parents you know, uh, influential people in our life at that period of time, where we've made decisions about ourselves and how we relate to the world and what is important to us for our survival, okay? So <clears throat> um, the, way to, the way you're gonna use this is this will give you a template for how people make decisions and take actions. It will predict how they will act and how they will feel threatened. Think of the human nervous system in front of you whenever you're communicating with another person as they're either opening or they're closing. At the most basic level, your communication is going to cause them to start to open up or start to close up at any one moment. So not only do you want to know what's going to cause the person to open up, right, but you also want to know what's going to cause them to close up so you know what to avoid in your conversation. And unfortunately, a lot of us are making really kind of common mistakes that can be very easily corrected if you just know. Our default is we tend to do what we think would work for us, thinking that that will work for everybody else. But if who you are selling to, who you are managing, who you are working with is not wired like you are, what you may be doing, which is very well intended and from the heart and your honest best approach to help them may be completely blowing it in their minds because of how they're wired. So this stuff's just incredibly important to have a realization of it. And um, it will affect every choice that you make as I, as I mentioned. So think of it as like, you know, you are the safe and your personality profile matrix is the combination of how to work with you. It's how to know which way your river's flowing so that you can adjust your goals and adjust your communication and what you're doing. So it feels a lot more like kind of floating downstream instead of trying to fight it and go upstream all the time. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example here real quick. So with United American uh, Bank, okay? What happened was 
they they came in they said look we're not doing great in the real estate loan market you know can you help us out so i went in and did what i call a psychographic profile on their sales team where i basically did a personality read on them and then i said give me your top five customers and you know like ideal customers uh, in this market and i did what's called a psychographic profile on them as well by doing that on you know the customer and the sales team i was able to see where they match and where they mismatch. And at the end of that, I was able to go back to the president and the senior you know, leadership team and say, listen, don't do any training in, this, in these following areas. Let them do whatever comes naturally. Encourage them to follow their intuition and encourage them to do what feels right in this area and they'll do just fine. But in these three areas, I want you to do something that's gonna to feel totally counterintuitive. And here's why. Because one of the things we found out was, is that on some areas, their personalities matched, but there was one big mismatch in the personality. And that was the customer they were selling to had a high, what we call freedom quotient, but the sales team had a high, what we call security quotient. And so when it came to presenting their offering and selling their product, they would be focused on all of the things that would be important and relevant to someone who was security minded like themselves. The problem is that's almost completely counter to the freedom minded person. What they care about is a totally different set of things. You know, freedom people, they want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. It's all about freedom options and upside potential. They couldn't care less about saving a nickel or a dime, but security people care very much about that. And so they would do this and they would blow the deal. Okay. Um, the other part of it was, is that both of them had both the customer and the ideal client had a high, what we call competency quotient in their personality as well. And competency based people have a very specific way they need to be handled. You don't tell a competency based person what to do. You don't say, you know what you need to do, or you know what your problem is. And you sure as heck don't challenge them because if you do that, you're going to have a big problem. And so I actually had to tell the um, president of the bank that there was one guy who was a brilliant deal maker. He was brilliant. He was a very big asset to the company. But I, I suggested privately to the president, you need to remove this guy from the field and don't let him go on any sales deals. What would happen is their sales team would go to like Texas, for example, and they would talk to some oil tycoon who, of course, they would get to their office and then the guy would make them wait for a while. And by the time <laughs> the team from the bank got in to meet with this guy, this one guy was so felt so disrespected and so kind of upset that this guy had made him wait that he started to do what we call an alpha challenge with the guy and he would kill the deal for the whole team. And the minute they removed him, their sales shot through the roof, right? Now, again, you wouldn't be able to spot this stuff unless you knew what I'm going to be going over here. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, before I tell you what these personal needs are, I want to tell you that there are four primary ways people start to close up and get grabbed and go into stress. And a grab in my book is anytime you go into an emotionally altered state where you lose choice. So a grab can be you getting aggressive. A grab can be you being withdrawn. A grab can be you completely shutting down and just hiding under the sheets. A grab can be you looking busy, right? And I'm sure many of you have had this where to other people, you look busy and you look productive, but secretly, you know, you're totally distracted. You're not doing the thing that you said you were going to do, the thing that you committed to doing to yourself, right? You look busy, you have the appearance of being engaged, but you're really kind of somewhat distracted. And so think of any time where you are losing choice, that's a grab. Any time where if you want to feel one way and you can't. So for example, if you want to be able to get up in front of a group of people and speak comfortably and easily, but you feel nervous and anxious, you've lost choice. So you would be technically considered grab. If you want to keep your cool in a challenging situation with a loved one, family member, or a friend, and you find yourself getting heated and it's hard to maintain that what we call equanimity, emotional balance, then you're grabbed and you've lost choice. Okay. And so one of the first layers that all of you want to learn, or I would encourage you to learn, is 
you want to get good at noticing when the person you're communicating with goes offline. Think of it like losing internet connection. All work stops. Nothing happens at all. And so this was originally developed by, let me make sure you can see my screen again, by Virginia Satir. Virginia Satir is a very famous family therapist. And she said, there's four primary ways we all cope with stress. Now with this, we all do all four. So when I describe this to you, you do all four of these, okay? You're not gonna get away from it. And what you wanna do is you wanna get good at noticing when you're in a coping mechanism and you wanna get good at noticing when the person you're communicating with goes into a coping mechanism. What these are, these are ways we kind of unconsciously protect our ego, right? And when we are afraid of like ego annihilation or loss of sense of self, loss of identity, anything that feels emotionally threatening to us, right? We're gonna go into one of these coping stances. Now, let me frame this by saying there are three basic biological drives that we all have within us. Many of us are familiar with the first two, but not the third. Number one is avoid pain. All of us are designed to avoid pain at any and all cost. This is just a biological directive so that we can stay alive long enough to keep life going. So anything that feels painful, whether it's mental or emotional, perceived or real, we will tend to avoid. Okay. The second thing is that we all seek pleasure. We can't get away from it, right? Things that feel good are things that we are naturally drawn towards. They give us a big dopamine hit in our nervous system. And in a natural environment, the environment we were really created for, like that paleolithic environment, the only two things that brought intense pleasure were food and sex. The two things we needed to risk our life for so that we could keep life going. So it's kind of like a biological directive. Now, the third and the one that a lot of people don't notice is the um, ability to conserve energy. And, and the layman's terms of that is taking the easy way out, <laughs> okay? So we are wired to take the easy way out. So why is it when, you see a, when you're trying to diet, you're hungry and you go to the kitchen, you see a bag of potato chips, and then you see a bag of baked uh, potatoes that you could cook and boil and bake. Everyone knows the potatoes are gonna be healthier if you just eat the plain potatoes. But why do we feel that strong pull to go for the potato chips? Because our body looks at it like a biological win. More calories, less effort, we should go for it, okay? So anytime you, you know, if we put you in a room with a saber-toothed tiger, you're going to go into fight or flight. It's going to trigger that fear in your nervous system. But if we threaten any one of your personal needs, you will also experience the very same thing. You'll go into fight or flight. So when your ego feels threatened, you're going to start to shut down and you want to know how you do it. You want to be aware of how you do it so that you can catch yourself and you can shift gears on what you're doing. Okay. Now we all, we each move through all of these and they're most easily noticeable when triggered by really intense stress and pressure, right? That's when this stuff is going to be the most obvious. Okay. So again, with this layer, don't worry about which one you do the most of. You just want to become aware of all four of these. Now, here's why. When you're in a coping mechanism, you're literally unable to take in new information. If you're trying to communicate with your child, with your loved one or your colleague, and they have gone into a coping stance, I promise you, they're not hearing a word you're saying. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to agree with you. It, no, none of what you're doing is going to work at all. Okay. And the flow of all positive and useful communication will stop immediately once one or more of the parties is in one of these coping stances. Like literally you stop trying to get your agenda across, you shift gears. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is work to get them out of the coping stance before you continue. And here's another reason why all decisions and actions while made in a coping mechanism are likely to be reactionary and they're not well thought out and they could have negative consequences. I would also venture to say, this is where all unnecessary harm occurs. So think about all the times you said things you regretted, right? You texted back or emailed back something, and then you later on wish you hadn't, or you were heated in the moment, you know, or you were feeling kind of weak-willed late at night and you broke down and had that snack anyway, or you blew off going to the gym in the morning, right? Or you failed to get a report done on time. I guarantee you, if you listen, you'll realize you're in one of these coping stances, okay? 
So here they are. The first one is the blamer. Now to do this, what I recommend that you do and what I have clients do in my virtual office these days is I have them walk through this with me. Okay, now I can't see most of the people here, but I'm going to demonstrate how I would do it. And we do it really dramatically. The reason why I have you do this dramatically is so that it locks into your nervous system an awareness of it. This is like a catch. And once you install this catch, the minute you attempt to go out and do this, you're going to bust yourself. You're going to catch yourself doing it. Okay, so the first one is this, it's the blamer. So you put one hand on your hip and you hold a hand out here and you go, how could you do this to me, right? And then I'll have them do it twice. How could you do this to me? This is the blamer. Now the blamer, when they're feeling intense stress and pressure, right? Their first immediate response is, it can't be my fault. It's not my fault. Because the fear is if it's my fault, I won't be able to recover from it. The consequences will be too big. Um, um, something really horrible could happen as a result or they'll never forgive me. Now, oftentimes in early childhood, right? If you have this tendency to do the blamer when you get stressed, you probably had the experience of making a mistake and there was a heavy consequence, or you saw someone else make a mistake and there's a really heavy consequence for it. So the blamer, they feel powerless and uncared for. When they get stressed, their feelings of isolation increase further. They may try to act like you know, the, you know, they've got it handled, they're, they're in charge. But the emotional state the blamer goes back and forth between is angry or hopeless or helpless. And what both of these have in common, they're opposite ends of the same spectrum, is there is zero accountability. They avoid accountability for what it will mean about them or fear of what the consequences will be. The strengths, however, of dealing with someone who's in the blamer mode, right, when they're pointing their finger at you, is that they tend to be a straight shooter. They'll let you know if they have a problem. They're much more emotionally transparent so they have no need to hide their emotions. They're not good at hiding it. They, uh, as a result, tend to not build anger and resentment nearly as much. And they can recover quickly once resolution has been met. The challenges, though, of dealing with a blamer is they're finger pointers and they have difficulty admitting when they're wrong. Their ten tendency is to focus on fault over solution. So if you're like a real solution-oriented person, if you like to like tackle a problem, get it done, and you're in a situation and there's a breakdown and you've got a blamer in the room, it can be kind of annoying because they, they instantly focus on whose fault it is and, and, and explain to everyone how it's not their fault and you know, no one informed them and they should know. Whereas people that are more kind of you know, action oriented and wanna get the job done and who aren't getting grabbed around that instantly go to, let's just fix this problem and move forward. Um, as a result, they also tend to not be team players as quite as well. They'll tend to pick scapegoats or enemies within the team. And that lack of accountability will inhibit their personal and professional growth, okay? Key identifiers are finger pointing, anger and depression, complaining about others, negative pessimistic view of the world, okay? Now, let me tell you a quick story about a blamer. So um, a good friend of mine, uh, Nancy and Chuck Hassig, right? They're an older couple and they were gonna take me and my ex-wife uh, wakeboarding one day. And so we get into, you know, the ski boat and we're heading out to this wakeboarding spot. On the way there, Chuck asked his wife, Nancy, and they were madly in love. So these people were like high school sweethearts. They're now in their 60s. You know, everyone who knows Nancy and Chuck knows that they absolutely adore one another. And Chuck says, hey, Nancy, grab the wheel. I'm going to hop in the water and do my slalom ski until we get to the wakeboarding spot. And she goes, I don't know. The water's a little choppy, Chuck. Maybe not today. And he goes, no, no, I got it. It's fine. So he gets in the water and like a minute later, he wipes out horribly. The ski comes up, cuts his eyelid in half, breaks his occipital bone. And he's got blood gushing out of his eye, right? And what's Nancy do? Nancy's up there in the boat pointing at him going, I told you not to get in the water. You never listened to me, Chuck. What's wrong with you? You know, and if you'd seen it from the outside, you would think, my God, this woman's crazy. But the reality of it is she loved her husband so much. The thought of her doing something to have harmed him was more than her nervous system could handle. So she rejected it and went into the blamer mode. OK, now let's talk about the next one here. The next one is the placator. And the placator goes like this really pitiful. When you do this, you have to get really pitiful. So whether you do it now, or whether you do it later, just do it. And you go like this, you go, whatever you want, I'm just here for you. Real pitiful like that. <laughs> okay, one more time. Whatever you want, I'm just here for you. 
Now the placator is very similar to the blamer. They're kind of like the kissing cousin, but they're not going to openly point their finger and blame at you. The placator is very concerned with how they'll be perceived by others. And again, their fear is if I really let out what I'm thinking, if I let out what I'm feeling, right? Um, I can't recover from that. I can't take it back. They may never forgive me. They may judge me. They may look at me differently. There may be some consequences that I can't get beyond. And so they'll tend to protect themselves by focusing on the needs of others. Okay. Their response to stress is largely to avoid it or minimize it, um, act like it's not that big of a deal. Um, because of this, they tend to avoid uncomfortable truths uh, a little bit more. They'll also preoccupy themselves with the needs of others as a way of not dealing with themselves. Why? Because they feel unsafe expressing their true emotions. And uh, one of the kind of telltale signs that someone's in placator mode is they'll act like they're in agreement when they're not. They'll be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. No, no, I don't mind at all. No, no, I'm happy to work Saturday and Sunday. I was, yeah, I was gonna hang out with the family, but that's okay, I, I don't need to be there anyway. And they'll do that. And so in early childhood, the placator often had the experience where they expressed their needs and it was shut down, or they grew up in a family system where other people were heavily criticized. Okay. And so you'll see this tendency. Um, one of my clients who was a nurse, now you could see how a nurse would be a great job for someone who's good at placating, right? Because it's focusing on the needs of others as a way of not dealing with yourself. Well, when she was a little girl, imagine this, she's going through puberty, the boys she likes at school maybe aren't talking to her or ignoring her, and the girls are excluding her from play, which is the female form of bullying. She goes home one day and her mom, who loves her very much, says, sweetheart, what's going on? You seem kind of down. And she starts to explain about, you know, how the guys weren't paying attention to her and the girls excluded her on the playground. And her mom, who cares and means well, would always say the same thing. She'd say, well, sweetheart, you should just be glad that you can go to school and you can interact with the other kids, unlike your sister over here. And her sister was severely mentally retarded. And so they really, you know, and her mom meant well and her mom loved her, but the unconscious message was your needs aren't important. And, you know, you shouldn't have any complaints because look at what your sister is going through. And so the, the strengths of someone who tends to placate is they work really hard to please others. They'll go above and beyond with minimal complaint. They're great employees because these people, boy, you can get them to stay late, come in early, work the weekend. They'll always tend to be friendly and non-confrontational on the outside. <clears throat> but the challenges are they'll not let you know where they really stand. And they'll have a tendency to overcommit and take on more than they can realistically handle. Okay. Small problems will turn into big ones as resentment builds because they're not really communicating and they're not telling people how they really feel and they're keeping it inside. The challenge with that is this stuff builds up. So it festers, resentment builds. Um, if you're managing someone who's a placator or tends to placate, you have to check and double check and triple check when you ask them to do something because they're going to have a hard time telling you no. They're going to have a hard time saying that they can't do it or that there's not enough time, or that it's not important. Um, also, if you are in a relationship with someone who handles stress by placating, by the time they actually clearly vocalize to you that there's a problem, it's probably already too late, and the relationship is over and destroyed. So if you are in a relationship with someone who tends to placate as a way of handling stress, Really, you have to pay extra attention to them to make sure that they're really okay with what they're agreeing to, okay? You don't have to worry about that with blamers. They'll let you know if they have a problem, but placators, you got to check, double check, and triple check, okay? Key identifiers, instant agreement, overzealousness about your request. That's a great idea. I love it. We should totally do it. Lack of authenticity, minimization of problems. Okay, and difficulty directing others. All right, let's go to the next one. The next one is the computer. So the computer goes like this. You lean back, you rub your chin, and you look up, and then you want to pontificate. You go, if one were to think about this, one may ascertain. If one were to think about this, one may ascertain. Now, the computer, and you'll see this professionally all the time. You'll be talking with someone, you'll be engaged, and all of a sudden they'll go, you know, 
why don't you send me some information and we'll get back to you. Or you'll be trying to talk to a loved one and confront them with an issue. And all of a sudden they'll go, you know what? I don't even care. Whatever you want to do. Doesn't, doesn't matter to me. You just do what you want to do. And what they're doing is they're emotionally checking out. What's going on here is they feel exposed and vulnerable when showing emotions. The fear is if I stay really connected with you, Tim, and we're talking that I don't know what's going to come out next. So to keep myself emotionally safe, I'm going to distance myself. I'm going to appear to be unaffected. I'm going to act like it doesn't bother me as much. Um, and one of the signs that they're doing this, besides the kind of physiological adjustment they'll make, is they'll sometimes go super logical or rational. So if you've ever confronted someone and then all of a sudden they've gone abstract on you, this is probably what happened, right? You go, you know what? I really don't like the way that, you know, you're, you're talking to me. I feel like you don't really care about my feelings. And you go, well, you know, what are feelings anyway? Or, you know, you know what? We're all just human beings walking through this earth here doing the best we can. And they'll kind of go abstract. That's a sign that they're doing it. What the computer's really trying to do is they're trying to get enough distance they can figure it out with the idea that they'll then re-engage. The challenge is they often never do it, okay? So the goal is to seek uh, and to appear unaffected. They'll hide their anger or hurt through detachment. And any person who's had to spend a prolonged period of time in a stressful situation will eventually learn to check out. If you grew up in a household or an environment with a lot of stress and pressure, you're great at doing this. Um, if you've had to work in an emergency room for a long period of time, there was a period of time as a counselor where I got hired as at a job that I thought was going to be a talking job. And on day one, they gave me a mouthpiece and told me to take off my tie and roll up my sleeves because that gave the client something to hold on to. And I was terrified. And I found out that I had to do physical restraints on people that would attack me nightly. And that went on for several years. So you, you, go, you live in an environment like that, you're going to learn how to mentally dissociate and check out. The strengths of being in this mode are work long stretches without taking a break. These people can stay focused on a task. They can see the big picture pretty easily. They tend to ignore discomfort. The challenges are they lack a lot of external awareness of others and surroundings. If any of you, or perhaps it's you, uh, have had loved ones who work on a computer and then you call them up and you try to ask them to do something or they call you up when you're working on a computer and you're in the middle of a project and they ask you to do something. If it goes in one ear and out the other, computer mode would be the answer to that. And the less external awareness you have, the less great you're going to be at rapport. Um, they can also attach to unimportant concepts and ideas. They're not quite as grounded in reality. Communication often goes in one ear and out the other. Key identifiers, mouth agape, staring off into space, you know, puzzled look indicating their thinking, folded arms, okay, leaning back. Now, realize I always have to say this, sometimes folded arms just means they're cold, right? So don't always assume, right? Sometimes it means that, you know, you know, they're cold or, you know, I remember one time there was this um, client, a guy I was working with, and he was walking around like this for a while. It was because the button had come off his shirt. And if he didn't, his shirt would kind of come open. So he was doing it for that way. Legs crossed. Again, don't always assume it just means they're checking out, but these are the signs and you'll see them do it. You'll see them do it. You'll see them kind of lean back. You'll see them uh, go into this. All right, now the last one is this, the distractor. So you kind of go like this. You go, hey, look over there. Hey, look over there. And the distractor, right? Um, oops. The distractor gets confused and overwhelmed by stressful situations. They're not sure what to do. They often grasp at straws. They can easily shift between the three types, placating, blaming, and computing. Um, the distractor often leaves one room goes to another, then can't remember what they were there for. They're often trying to kind of take on more than they can really handle. And when it comes to completing a task, they have a difficult time staying focused and they're a bit all over the place. The strengths of the distractors, they don't stay upset for very long. They're used to chaos. They're comfortable with abrupt changes to the plan and they're easily redirected, right? So if you have someone who tends to go into distractor mode when they're stressed, right? Or if you do it, Realize one of the benefits of this is it's really easy to get them out of it. You just go, hey, look over there. And, you know, they can 
you know, look at something new and then suddenly have a whole different reality. Challenges are they need a lot of supervision. They easily get off topic in conversation. They have a difficult time completing tasks and they need complex information simplified in order to digest and follow, okay? Key identifiers are frazzled looking. They often speak in incomplete thoughts, attempted multitasking and difficulty committing to one task or goal, okay? Now, here's how to use them. If someone else is in a coping stance, if you watch someone kind of go into one and clamp up a little bit, right? They're blaming, they're placating, they're computing, they're distracting. Maybe they're doing all four. Maybe they're doing a mixture of them. If someone is in one, what you want to do is just stop trying to get your point across. Stop trying to reach agreement. If you are in one, do not make any major decisions, declarations, or take action. Don't call up your Aunt Mildred to tell her how you really feel after 20 years of bottling it up inside. Okay. <laughs> Don't put the house on the market. Don't go buy, you know, the midlife crisis mobile. Like don't make any major decisions. You will regret it. Don't pack up your stuff and walk out of the office. Okay. Instead, what you want to do is learn how to help take the stress and pressure off. Okay. Of the person that's in one. Okay. If your loved one is in one, you want to learn to take the stress and pressure off. If you're in one, you want to take the stress and pressure off so that the person comes back to what we call the leveler, okay? And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the leveler right now, but the leveler is how you are when you're not going to these coping stances, okay? It's uh, you accept stress as normal. You're more comfortable with ambiguous and uncertain situations. You often engage with threats rather than fighting or running, them, running away from them, Um Levelers, they tell it as it is. They're not exaggerating. They're not in denial. They're not making a mountain of a molehill, but they deal with things as they are. And they're much more comfortable expressing their feelings and able to discuss them. Okay. So now <clears throat> here's the thing. We've gone through these really, really quickly. There's the blamer, the placator, the computer, and the distractor. And when you are feeling intense stress and pressure, you'll do one of these. Now, you may at work go right into placator mode because you don't feel safe just open, openly blaming and pointing the finger and yelling at people because you go, that's not going to look good or that's not going to be good professional. So a lot of us may placate at work when something upsets us, but when we're at home with our loved ones we feel comfortable with, who we know, like, and trust us, we might just go straight to blaming them. So that's why I say this isn't, we, we all do all four, but just start to notice which ones you do. And get good at noticing when you're going into a coping stance and when you're coming out of a coping stance. Because when you're in one, stop trying to get the point across. That's the main kind of benefit of doing this. Now, to understand how someone gets in a coping stance and how to get them out, you want to learn what we call the five personal needs. So I'm just going to go through these really briefly and explain what they are. They are freedom, security, belonging, competency, and self-expressive. These are the five personal needs, okay? The freedom person wants to do what they want to do when they want to do it. They don't want to be told otherwise. For them, it's all about options, options, options. Their whole attitude is give me liberty or give me death. And they hate feeling restricted, limited, or controlled, okay? So if you tell a freedom-based person, hey, let's go out tonight, but we're going to go to this country Western bar out in the middle of nowhere. They only serve beer. They only play Shania Twain. And if it's a bus, that's it for the night because there's nothing else around. They don't want to go. But if you say, hey, we're going to Vegas. We got a jet fueled up. We're flying into Vegas. We've got VIP backstage access passes to every club in town all night long. They're, they're going to get right on that plane with you and they're going to want to go because it's going to be much more appealing to their nervous system because they're freedom. Okay. When they look at a new experience, they're thinking what will give me freedom and options and adventure and what will prevent restriction, limitation, or control. Okay. Now, if someone's security minded, however, and you say, let's go clubbing tonight, they may ask you the exact same question. Where are we going to go? But what they're looking for is a very different set of criteria. They're looking for, is it safe? Right. They want assurance. They want to know 
what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, who it's going to happen with, how long is it going to last, how much is it going to weigh, what's it going to cost, when's it going to end? The more, the more assurance, the more safety, the more security they can derive, the more the nervous system relaxes and opens up. And what will cause a security-based person to tighten up is feeling chaos, uncertainty, risk, anything like that. So if you tell your, your security-based friend, well, it is, it is in the worst part of town and there will be gang activity there. So don't wear red, don't wear blue, don't look anyone in the eye, stay close to the group, but it's a great DJ, you're going to love it. They're not going to go. <laughs> They're not going to want to go. But if you tell them, look, we're going to go to the Mark Hopkins Hotel up in San Francisco. It's a very safe hotel. They've got underground valet parking, also very safe. They've got a high cover charge to keep the riffraff out, but there's no financial risk because we know the Mater D. We've got a table reserved from 11 p.m. to midnight. There's going to be a jazz trio playing. Susie and John are going to join us. We're each going to have two drinks and take an Uber home. That's going to fit the way her nervous system is wired, and she's probably going to say yes. Okay? All right. Now, the next person is the belonging person. And the belonging person, they want to be loved, they want to be accepted, and they want to be included. This is the top things they care about, okay? And their biggest fear is being rejected, unloved, or excluded. And so when we bring up this idea of going out, the only question the belonging person is thinking about is who's going? They don't care where we're going. They don't care what we're doing. They just want to know who's going. And if we say, well, actually, everyone else we know is going to be over at this other place, right? But me and Sarah are going to go to this Hells Angels biker bar. You know, we will definitely not fit in. We're going to stick out like a sore thumb, but it's a great guitar player. He's not going to want to go. He's going to want to go be with everybody else. Make sense? Okay. Next one, we got two more to cover. The next one is competency-based. And the competency-based person, they like to uh, set a challenge and complete it. These are go-to people. They love the validation they feel and they get from being competent and accomplished and you know, setting a goal and achieving it. Now realize that they'll never admit openly that they're doing it for validation because that doesn't look good. That makes them look bad. And competency-based people want to look good and they want to feel better then. They also won't admit that either, but they'll... And, and one of the ways they'll cover it up is they'll say, I just like to challenge myself. I like to push myself. I like to be the best person I can be. But secretly, they're really working for validation. And they want to as, elevate themselves as high as they can because that's how their nervous system feels safe, by bringing lots of value and being very, very valuable. So their biggest stressors, what we call key stressors, are feeling disrespected, unappreciated, or incompetent. That's like a knife in the back to the competency-based person. So if we tell our competency-based friend, Cecil, we say, look, Cecil, we're just going to go to the Irish bar on the corner. Don't wear your suit. Everyone will think you're a limo driver, okay? Don't use your $10 words. No one knows what they are there or cares. All they care about is can you drink beer, play pool, and fight, all three of which he's lousy at, okay? Cecil's not going to want to go do that. But if we tell Cecil, listen, Cecil, we understand that you have some specialty knowledge of a certain kind of microchip that's actually being used currently by the Department of Defense. I've got a colleague in Washington who'd like to have a private meeting with you. We're going to send a jet. The jet's going to fly you to D.C. We'd like you to keep it under wraps. We need you to sign an NDA, uh, but it's a, high, uh, it's a high security profile meeting. We'd like you to be there. There's no way he's going to say no to that because it's exclusive. It elevates him. It makes him feel more special. It makes him feel like he has more value and it completely fits his nervous system okay i hope that makes sense now let's go to our last friend here and then we'll open up for some questions our last friend is Dwayne, and Dwayne, of course does not spell his name phonetically or any way you could possibly guess he uses some dollar sign or hashtag or something you couldn't possibly figure out so that when he explains it to you he can show you how unique and special and different he is why Dwayne is the self-expressive person the self-expressive person is like the tortured artist. They're all about being unique and special and different. And in their nervous system, if they're not unique and special and different, they are like a waste of space. Their biggest fear for them is being average, ordinary, or irrelevant. That's like death to them. Okay, so that's why you get this like tortured artist. So if you tell Dwayne, hey, we're just going to go to Chili's for happy hour. They have half off beers. Dwayne doesn't want to go. 
But if you tell Dwayne that there's this new DJ that no one's heard about in the US yet, he's going to be coming out next month. He's flying in from Hamburg. There's going to be an underground all night rave. And you're going to go down this alley. There'll be a guy with a green hat. You give him a gold coin. You go down the manhole. You know, the weirder, the more out there, the more unique and special, the better for the person like Dwayne. Because again, that's how they feel emotionally safe is by being unique and special and different. Okay. And I apologize, folks. I know that I'm like flying through these two levels, but let me tell you how to put them together. Okay. So if someone is starting to get stress and pressure, right? They're starting to close up in front of you and now they're blaming, placating, computer and distracting. If you have an awareness of what their number one and number two personal need is, you can have a pretty good guess of what caused them to clamp up and then you can counteract that. So each one of these personal needs has key attractors and key stressors, right? If you're freedom, you care about options, adventure, and upside potential, and you hate restriction, limitation, and control. So if you're talking to a freedom person and you start to tell them, hey, look, you know, we've got this new job. We think you're going to love it, but you have to work a lot more hours. You have to work in this one location. You always have to show up at the office, right? And you have to report to this person every single day and tell them what you're doing. And you watch the person go clamp up. You know exactly what got them. It's that feeling restricted, limited, or controlled, okay? What would sell them on the job is if you talked about, but by the way, this job also has an unlimited earning potential and it could expand in this way and it could offer you this opportunity. Those are going to be the things that are going to get them to open back up, okay? Um, let's say that you're dealing with someone who's competency-based, for example, and a lot of People that are probably on this call are going to have a strong competency-based part of your personality. Now, realize you have all five of these in you, folks. But if I was doing a profile on you individually, right, which I would do in an evaluation, what I would do is I'd figure out what your number one and your number two is, right? Because that is going to give me a template for how you make decisions. If competency is number one, the first thing you're going to take a look at in any new opportunity is... Is it a smart decision or not? Will this make me feel smarter? Will this make me feel more competent? Or will this make me look bad or feel incompetent? If it makes you feel smarter, more competent, you'll do it every time. If freedom is your next most important criteria, you'll look at, will this give me options and upside potential? Or will, or will it make me feel restricted, limited, and controlled? Um, if you're talking with someone who is competency-based and they start to clamp up, you might want to ask yourself, did I tell them what to do? Did I order them around? That will cause the freedom and the competency to tighten up. Competency-based people do not like to be talked down to, okay? It will definitely cause massive stress and pressure in their nervous system. So like if I'm having to give feedback to a competency-based person, I'll almost always do it in a third-party story. That's a lot less threatening to the nervous system. And I'll make sure to show them respect and reverence in a genuine way as I'm giving them feedback. And you can watch their nervous system tighten or loosen back up depending on how you're doing this, okay? So I'm seeing that one of the questions is how do you determine what type? Well, what you want to do is once you have kind of, um, you'd have to maybe play back through this presentation because I know I went through it pretty fast, is take a look at what stresses you out. Every person you talk to will tell you what they love about or tell you what they love and they'll tell you what they hate if you get them talking long enough. And for you folks, what I encourage you to do is when things upset you over the next week, ask yourself, which bucket is this upset living in? Do I feel restricted, limited, or controlled, right? In the freedom bucket, do I feel risk, uncertainty, or you know, security fears uh, in the security bucket? Do I feel like someone's excluding me or rejecting me or doesn't love me? Is my fear that I'm going to lose respect, appreciation, or feel incompetent? Or is my fear that I'm just not special and unique enough? And what you'll find out is all of your stress has a theme. And that theme almost always matches your first and your second personal need. One other way this shows up is that, you know, whatever your dominant ones are, because your attention span is so limited, you'll push everything else out. So when I was a kid, I broke a lot of bones. I broke my arm twice. I impaled myself. I uh, almost died, you know, um, uh, surfing. 
um, I've had a number of injuries because I was so freedom oriented. Uh, the f- idea that I could get hurt or that there would be a safety concern literally never occurred to me. I would see a big rope hanging out over a ravine. All I could think about was how great it would be to grab onto that rope and swing out over that ravine. And it never occurred to me that I could get hurt until I fell and broke my arm in two places. I didn't even think about it. And I would do that kind of stuff all the time. I fell out of a tree and paled myself on a property marker because I wanted to see if I could climb this one tree. And it never occurred to me that maybe I could fall, maybe I could get hurt. Okay. Same thing with surfing. I came out to California in my 20s. I bought a surfboard. And I went into the ocean, just figured I'd figure it out, you know, because all I could think about was how great it was going to be to catch a wave. And I had no idea how to surf. So, of course, it was, you know, pretty, pretty rough learning curve there in the beginning. Okay. So um, there's also fun games we can play to figure out which one's dominant too. So once you figure out your kind of top two or three, we can, we can help you figure out which one is dominant. And all of the coaching that I do, all of the programs that I design, um, habit control, anything like that, always have to take into account these personal needs because we use them to predict ahead of time what parts of the program the way they're set up will cause the person stress and what parts will be easy. We leverage the parts that are going to be easy. And then we have to very artfully redesign around the parts that would cause you stress so that it doesn't. Um, If you develop an awareness of this, what you'll find is it will make you intensely curious about other people. And um, one of the things I'll, I'll wrap up with this is that all of this, one way to look at it is all of this that I'm teaching you now is a ruse to get you to get out of being judgmental with yourself and others in your communication and to be curious instead. That's one of the big shifts that it will cause is it'll cause you to be curious about others. And when they're not reacting and responding the way you want, instead of instantly taking offense because it's not what you want, you start to get curious and wonder what's going on with them. Okay. So at this point, I'll take some questions. Um, And I see a lot of them in here. Let's see here. How would one be a successful leader guide to guide someone with a freedom need when the task at hand requires a lot of structure and security? Okay, yeah. So what you want to do is each one of these personal needs has key attractors. There's like four bullet points and key stressors. And so what you want to do then is if you have to lead a freedom person through a highly structured trajectory, first off, that's not a natural fit for them, okay? But if you have to do it, what you want to do is show them how doing this and how kind of corralling yourself in in this moment is going to increase your freedom, give you more options and huge upside potential. And how it will also help them avoid restriction, limitation and control in the future. The more you can show them that, the more they'll jump right in that uh, that path and that structure and follow through on it. Um, Next question is, how do the needs of coping mechanisms work for people who are trying to lose weight and quit smoking? Well, my gosh. So think of any place where you get stuck when it comes to trying to lose weight or quit smoking and any place where you're not doing what you said you're going to do. If you're not exercising when you said you were going to, if you're eating more than you said you were going to eat, listen to yourself and listen to how you talk yourself into not doing what you said you were going to do. You will I guarantee be blaming, placating, computing, or distracting, okay? And then what you want to do is you want to, again, show yourself how doing this is going to increase your freedom. So I'll give you a quick weight loss example, okay? Weight loss is all about eating less forever and being okay with that. So someone whose freedom wants to do what they want to do when they want to do it without restriction, without limitation, without control, how are you going to get them to feel good about eating less forever, right? Well, one of the ways that we do it in the office is, is that we'll give them the suggestion that how much they used to eat, the idea of eating as much as they used to feel so restrictive, limiting, and controlling that they can't bear to do it. I'll be so overstuffed, so uncomfortable, so uh, lethargic, so bloated, I'm not willing to do that. So I eat less permanently because it feels better, because it gives me more options, because I have a lighter step, I have more spring in my step, I have, I'm more mentally clear and focused when I'm not walking around all bloated and greasy and lethargic. 
So again, we just align it with their personal needs. There's so many aspects of any experience that we can look at. And so when you know your personal needs or the personal needs of the person you're communicating with, you know what parts of that 2 million bits of information to focus on, okay? And so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, uh, Anna, do we have time to take a few more questions? It's 101. Yeah, we absolutely have time. Yes, if people need to jump off, um, they can. The recording will be available. Okay, great. All right. Next question is, how do you determine what type of person you're talking to when just meeting someone and you don't have a lot of time to pose questions and situation to figure out their personal needs? Yeah. So the thing is, one of the things that's really neat about this way of personality profile is it's done on site and then validated through conversation. Okay. So there are certain ways that people will dress, um, certain ways that people show up. And the minute you get them to talk about anything, you know, you might say, you know, hey, I really like your jacket. You know, how did you choose that? Or, you know, oh, you're a real estate broker. How did you get into the business? The minute they start talking, you're going to hear them talking about the things they care about and the things they want to avoid. And that will be a very fast clue as to their personal needs. If I had more time, folks, I have commercials. I have five commercials. Each one is designed for one of the personal needs. And even though I flew through this, if I show you those commercials right now, you would instantly know which one matches up. So this stuff is pretty easy to get up and running. Um, but you look at it's like, so a freedom person, for example, will dress with lots of options, right? They may wear like, you know, what we call California professional. They have a sport coat. And then underneath, they have a t-shirt and some jeans, but they have nice shoes. So they could be dressed up. They could be dressed down. They dress with lots of options. Belonging people, right? What are they going to do? Well, you know, if their family loves the 49ers, they'll wear their 49er garb. You know, belonging people love to wear the team garb. If they work for Google, they want to wear their Google stuff, right? And they'll dress in a very kind of socially acceptable way. Competency-based people, they'll want to look good. They'll want to look better than, so they'll want to dress nice. They might have some more name brand things. They might be a really sharp dresser. They might look a certain way. And a self-expressive person, of course, they're going to dress totally unique and special and different. So look at designers, for example, look at artists, right? If you see someone walking down the street and they've got like really crazy hair, they completely stand out. Chances are they're pretty self-expressive. Um, people who are security, oftentimes they might wear a lot of lines. They might wear tight lines, you know, um, crisscross lines, you know, like the squares or pinstripes, things like that. They might have very pointed glasses. Um, so there are a lot of tells in just the appearance. Um, there's tells in how they fill out a form. So in my office, when people come in and fill out a form to lose weight or quit smoking or reduce stress or sports performance, I take a look at how they filled out the form. Freedom people would barely fill it out. Security people would fill it out in excruciating detail. <laughs> Okay, and then also the things that they would talk about as well would be another indicator. Okay. Um, so again, you know, I'm seeing a lot of some questions about like, how do you figure it out? You know, look at when next time you get upset, ask yourself, what really bothered that about me? Right? Or what really bothered me about that situation? You know, let's say you didn't get invited to a party. Did you really want to go to the party? You know, you know, or was it, did you feel disrespected? Did you feel, you know, like they were, they were talking down to you? You know, if you get upset in a situation, ask yourself, what about this really bothers me? Is it that you don't feel special enough? Well, then maybe you're self-expressive. Is it that you feel like you're not getting the respect you deserve or you're not, you know, as competent as you would like to be, right? Well, then maybe you're competency-based. If you're feeling just kind of rejected, excluded, unloved, then maybe you're, you know, belonging. If you're feeling just unsafe and scared and nervous and not sure what to do next, maybe your security, you know, if you're feeling restricted and limited and control and you can't wait for this talk to end and you want to get out of here and go do something else, then you're probably freedom. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. So let me go to, thank you. Someone's asking for um, information about uh, my website. So let me go to that and put up my information for you. Thank you for reminding me, whoever you were. Okay, folks, so here is my information. You can go here, you can get the free NLP course on here. 
You can also book an evaluation for personal professional coaching, of course. Um, that is my uh, office line and cell phone number. I carry this one with me everywhere I go. So I'm very text friendly. I'm very text friendly. But we all always offer a free evaluation, no charge for that. Um, and then you can meet with me directly online um, to find out more about how we might be able to help you or your team or your company. So uh, feel free to reach out, feel free to contact me. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Robert. We want to most definitely thank you as well. I want to thank all of you guys, the ones that are still hanging out here, even though it's six minutes after our official end time. <laughs> I see a lot of thank yous in my chat. Um, thank you guys just as much. And I also want to remind everybody that the recording will be available by the end of this week on the shift website under the recording tab. Um, again, I hope everybody has a wonderful and a safe rest of their day. And we appreciate everybody for finding time for today's Lunch and Learn. Thanks so much. Yes. All right.